You are listening to the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast, where you discover management insights and strategies for your successful dental practice. There are also interviews with key people in the industry who have advice and services to help you and your team achieve great success. Welcome to this episode of the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast. And I have a returning guest. I'm so delighted. Dr. Mark Hassett, the relaxed dentist, is joining us again. Welcome back, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Julie. It's good to be back. I always enjoy our chats. As do I. And today's topic is something that you are helping a lot of dental practices with, and that's efficiency as a dentist. So tell us a little bit more about why being an efficient dentist is just so important. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, of course, I've got this mindset that I enjoy efficiency myself. But uh, one thing I did was when I retired from practice, I was in practice over 30 years myself, I actually did a bit of work around various other practices. And one of the things I really noticed was that in the practices that were set up for efficiency, the ones that were best organised, it was easy to be productive, but also it was easy to work. And then other practices where they weren't set up for efficiency, where they didn't have things right or their systems right or the equipment right or the staffing levels right or whatever it was, by the end of the day, I just wanted to go back to the hotel room and put a cold flannel on my forehead and lie down. It was such a, a difficult experience. So efficiency does two things. I mean, it gives you more productivity so you can earn more and, and, and be more successful in that way. But also being efficiency efficient. So many people think it makes your life stressful and harder and, and you've got to work harder. But actually, it's exactly the opposite. As you get your practice set up for efficiency and productivity, the life of the dentist becomes easier and easier and easier. And in, in, in super efficient practices, it's almost like you just walk around and the staff just tell you, oh, go here and do this. And you go, OK, all right. <laughs> your life just becomes so easy as practices become set up for efficiency. So there are two big benefits, the, 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 the money side, the productivity side, but also ease of life you know and that's that's a great benefit too it is a great benefit and i often to get people's heads in the space of understanding the impact in a dental surgery is to relate it back to your home life and if you can imagine you know you're a, a busy parent at the, you know during the day you've got three kids you've got to get all the housework done you've got to get all the shopping done you got to make sure the kids are maybe being homeschooled and all these things are having to ha have happened uh, and then dinner at, at the end of the evening and the homework and all the things if you just approached every day without any plan, without anything in flow, it would be a chaotic day and you would feel like you are being pulled in all sorts of different directions. However, if you had, this is a clear set of the tasks I've got to get done today and while the laundry is being done, I'll go out and do the shopping and then while I'm doing this, I'm going to be doing that as well. That is a well-planned day and, it, and as, you know, it's obvious that that would reduce the stress down. So I agree with you. I think the very first thought that comes up into mind when we think about efficiency is, gosh, I'm going to be timed down to the last minute. Isn't that stressful? But it does. It, re it really does reduce down that level of stress. And goodness knows that one of the challenges that the dental profession is under at the moment, along with a whole bunch of other industries, is recruitment and keeping great staff. And a very quick way of losing a great staff member is to give them a chaotic day every day. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the analogy or the, the model for efficiency that I like to show people is a Formula One team changing tyres. And if you go back several decades, it used to take 30 seconds to change the tyres. But as over the years, as the, um, as the technologies advanced, they've got better equipment, they've got better staff, all this sort of thing, the, de the um, dentist, I was about to say, the driver just comes into the pit lane, pulls off, and in 1.86 seconds, he's driving off again with a new set of tyres. And the dental office, I think, can be like that. The analogy is that the... The dentist's role in the dental office is to diagnose and treat. That's it. Nothing else. Like all the dentist should be doing all day is diagnosing and treating. And then 
everything else should be taken care of by the team so that the dentist can just focus on those two things. Because if you think about it, if you look at the dental practice as a productive entity, the only time you can generate billable income is when the dentist is diagnosing or treating. If the dentist is out the back pouring up the models, if the dentist is writing lab sheets, if the dentist is sending referral letters, all those other things generate zero income. So to put it in the, back to the analogy of the Formula One racing team, what you want the dentist to do is spend as much of their day in the car, driving the car, which is diagnosing and treating. And I mean, imagine if, if, if you had a put, pit stop and the dentist, you know, the car pulled in and the driver said, here, let me help you with the tires and jumped out, of the, <laughs> jumped out of the car and said, let me, everything would slow to a halt, wouldn't it? And, and <laughs> we'd have a five minute pit stop or whatever it might be. So um, yeah, diagnose, treat, just stick to the, stick to what you really should be doing as the dentist. I love that analogy, Mark, and it reminds me, recently I came across Alta Green and she's a magnificent woman who was speaking about <clears throat> how to come back into a space of creative and innovative problem solving in business, in life, in everything, and speaking about the impact of being innovative. And she used the analogy of, and I'll get the teams wrong, I think it was Ferrari was always winning because they had the best car. And there was another, I have no idea what the other group were, but let's call it McLaren. That's the only other one that's coming to my mind. They were thinking, well, how can we win Formula One when Ferrari have the best car? So they kept making tweaks to the engine and the car itself to try to make it faster. Then they realised they were never going to top Ferrari in terms of the structure of the car itself and the design of the car itself. And so they came from a very innovative way and they instead developed the, the quickest way possible to do that, that um, pit stop process. And because of that, that helped them win. And so this, this different approach to how to be an effective dentist, a productive dentist, is a really wonderful step to take. And I can imagine that being a practitioner, I'm not a dentist myself, obviously, but being a practitioner, young, younger kind of new grad space, you go into a dental practice and you might have the owner of the practice say, it'd be really nice to increase your hourly rate. And you think the only way you can do that is by, in essence, you know, fixing the structure of the car. I have to start doing all of my treatments in a quicker time and that's going to be high pressure for me. But with your insights around efficiency, you really, as you say, you're, you're just adjusting the pit stop area. You're just, a, you're not being pressured into squeezing more treatment into a smaller period of space of time. You're recognizing all the things that impact your level of efficiency and just by looking after these other things, you're going to be, end up being more productive. Yeah, absolutely. What I see in a lot of practices is they're understaffed and they have insufficient equipment. And that's, that's basically it. So that means that the dentist has to spend a big proportion of their day doing things other than diagnosing and treating. Uh, and that's, that's a big problem. I mean, if you think about it, if a dentist is working out of one surgery, which is the classic setup across all the dental industry, the dentist has one surgery. Now, how long does it take to flip a surgery? I'd say even if the staff are pretty good, you're talking 10, 12 minutes, something like that to between when one patient leaves and the next one, it's ready to go. Well, if you were seeing 10 patients a day, that's 10 times 12, which is 120 minutes a day, the dentist is sitting there doing something other than diagnosing and treating patients. Uh, add one surgery into that mix, an extra surgery, and the dentist just finishes with one patient, goes next door, you know, hello, starts the next patient. Without all that downtime, that gives you two hours a day. If you're working five days a week, 10 hours a week. If you think what you could produce in 10 hours a week, like what is your hourly rate as a dentist? You, you need to factor that. I mean, even if you're not that productive, it might be $500 an hour. It would be 600 you know, so... The simple thing of having an extra surgery gives you five or six thousand dollars of potential revenue per week. It's quite amazing. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And coming from a DA background, you know, quite often the, the with those single surgery.
clinicians who want to increase their productivity, the pressure does kind of flow onto the dental assistant. Be quicker with the room changeover. Don't go out of the room and do steri right now. And so then they experience that level of stress. And I would imagine that your your pathway to becoming that more efficient dentist, your DA plays an enormous role in that. You don't want to start alienating them by <laughs> throwing all the pressure onto them and making life more difficult for them. And so therefore creating that structure so we can move forward with these different ways of doing things without delegating the stress of it. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. One really nice thing that dentists can do, um, and, and it takes a bit of uh, thought and effort is to try and reverse engineer their practice. Um, one of the questions that I got exposed to very early in my dental career was the question, how much is enough? Now, if you ask dentists how much they want to earn per year and how many hours they want to work, the answer is, you know, with the, how much they want to work, earn, it's always just a little bit more. You know? <laughs> and if you can actually figure out um, in your life how much you want to earn per year and whatever that answer might be, it might be $200,000 net, it might be three, it might be four, whatever that number is for you, then you can work out, well, okay, I'm going to work 200 days a year, I'm going to work eight hours per day, and you can reverse engineer. So that means I need this hourly rate. And so if you look at your... Uh, you know, reverse engineering, look at the hourly rate you're aiming at, then you realise the level of equipment, the level of staff that you need to be able to produce that hourly rate. And if you're not currently hitting it, the, the tendency is for dentists, if they're not sort of achieving enough income, they just work longer and longer hours, which is a path to burnout. I mean, throughout my entire dental career, I only worked four eight-hour days. That was it four, eight-hour days. So every week I had a, a three-day weekend, which was super nice. You know, you get to go away or do things. Um, and, and you can do that by reverse engineering, by providing the right number of staff, the right amount of equipment, and uh, then you get to produce at that level where you just... I mean, I used to have the situation where I'd walk out of one room and the staff would say to me, oh, room two, Mrs Jones, prep 1415. And I'd say, oh, OK. OK. You know, <laughs> and I'd walk into that room and, hello, Mrs. Jones, you know, we, we're here going to prepare these two teeth for you today. Oh, that's good, you know, and everything's set up, everything flows. And it's it really is that concept of I'm just coming in for a pit stop, you know, and a boom, I'm going again in 1.86 seconds. Just so, it, it was just so relaxing, such a peaceful way to practice um, and yet incredibly productive at the same time. It's making me think that, well, number one, what you're talking about is freedom. When that reverse, I love that reverse engineer process because that allows you to say, well, this is how much I want to earn. This is how many hours I'd like to earn it in. And that's freedom. That's a, a beautiful sense of control. But also from the daily operations of the practice, it brings it away from constantly practitioner driven. You do this, you do that. Come on, next, next patient in to systems driven that you have assessed the systems and refined them to a degree where you can then rely on the systems and the systems themselves are directing the behaviours of the day. So it reduces down that intense thinking time too, I would imagine. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love efficient systems. Um, a goal really for every practitioner, every practitioner, your goal should be to never have to speak with the staff. Now, I don't say that in a mean way, like you don't want to speak with staff, but what I mean is that you want them so well trained and so well understanding the processes and systems that you never have to say anything. Like when you go to do X, Y, or Z, they just have all the things ready for you. Um, and um, we reached that stage with, with, in terms of like our restorative work where we could actually work for an hour or more with instruments going in all directions, materials going in all directions, impressions being mixed, all this sort of stuff. And I never had to say a thing. It just happened. Like I just put my hand out and the right instrument would drop into my hand. I'd, uh, I'd reach over for the handpiece and the correct burr was already in the handpiece. So it, it, that's sort of when you get to that level where you don't have to... Uh, like. It's almost like telepathy. You don't have to ask for anything. You don't have to tell the staff to do anything. The, the um, Where it's most tiring is 
would you please give me the bond? Please give me the etch. Please give me the burr. Please, you know, and you're just constantly sort of stepping them through the process. But once you get your systems right, you just never have to ask for a single thing. And that's, that's a great place to be. That is a great place to be because you're also creating an environment where the, all the team, including the DAs, have a strong sense of autonomy because they know what to do next. Because it's certainly been my experience working with so many team members that we hate being told what to do. <laughs> we hate being constantly directed, pass me this, pass me that, pass me this. And so allowing them that sense of autonomy, again, it increases their level of job satisfaction and their enjoyment working in that particular location as well. Getting the right people is important, isn't it? Oh, yeah, getting the right people. Here's an interesting thing. Um, my staff told me I am not allowed to go to the reception area right? I'm not allowed to go out to the front desk or the reception. Now, why am I not allowed to go out there? Well, my job is to diagnose and treat, so I'm not doing my job if I'm out there. But also, if I'd go out there, I would screw things up. I would slow things down. I'd start chatting with the patients. <laughs> and they used to hate it when they were sort of trying to check a patient out or they're trying to make the next appointment. And I'm standing there going, yeah, da, 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 da. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it just made everything a complete mess. So they like that autonomy to be able to, this is our domain, butt out. You know? And, yeah. and I, I love that too, you know. And then I, yeah. I love that. So the benefits of, and I've just made a little note here, just for dental practici practitioners out there that might be more new grads, you know, always keep in mind that um, this, this figure in your head, if you can... Um, achieve a lovely working week, which is eight hours a day, four days a week, which is very good for a dentist, isn't it? Because it, we've got to always be aware that, you know, decade upon decade, how much stress are you putting the body under, etc. But if you were working that lovely working week of four days a week, eight hours a day, 46 weeks in a year, counting for four weeks holiday, two weeks of public holidays uh, accumulated, an additional every additional fifty dollars an hour that you can earn is about seventy thousand dollars extra every year upon turnover, and so the productivity side is really compelling. It's certainly worthwhile the that journey to becoming more efficient. We've spoken about that the team morale is better because we enjoy working in an environment that is of great efficiency rather than a little bit chaotic and a little bit, you know, there's always one person kind of pushing the cart or pulling the cart the whole time. But with the other thoughts that were coming to my mind when I was looking through your website and turning my mind to it was there is an increase, surely an increased sense of professionalism that the patients observe as well when it's a well-oiled machine, a very efficient pit stop. Oh, yeah. Well, we used to get the comments like we'd, we'd have maybe 90 minutes booked for to do a quadrant of restorations. And um, we'd do those, do those. And, and the whole time, all these instruments are just passing in all directions and everything's happening. And there's, there's really no breaks in the procedure. It's just flowing really nicely. And uh, not a single word is said for the entire 90 minutes. Like it's just all 100 percent focus on the on the task at hand. And the patients at the end, they'd go like, wow, that was so impressive, you know. <laughs> how did everyone know how to do that? And I go, well, you know, we just, we practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that is what it is. It ends up being practice, doing things over and over again. That's how you get mastery. You don't get, and this, so this is something else to kind of put out there to everybody as well, is don't think that you can implement a whole bunch of new systems this week and next week we've got top efficiency going on. Everyone has to have that chance to practice and repeat and then develop mastery, mastery around that. And I've also got cost savings written down as well because the minute we become more efficient, surely that saves on the costs of the practice. Yeah, well, here's an interesting thing. I, when I travel around, I generally see practices now running with overheads 70, 80%, sometimes even more, you know, like I've seen practices up in the 90% overhead range. You know, that's when there's multiple dentists and, and things like that. And um, my practice used to run at about a 50% overhead. And I think it was just the efficiency, as far as I can tell, the fact that, you know, I was able to keep that. So you're really going to keep your overhead um, much lower if you can be more efficient. 
Um, one of the, I also talk with dentists about communication and how to communicate efficiently with patients. That is, keep your treatment exp explanations short. You know, instead of taking 30 minutes or 45 minutes to explain treatment, just explain it in one minute, you know, and that that will actually be more, more successful because that keeps overheads low. I mean, even in a well-run practice, you're looking at overheads now of $300, $350 an hour per room, which is quite substantial. So if, if you've got a $300 an hour overhead and you spend half an hour talking with a patient about treatment, that means you've just handed that patient $150 which is um, a real substantial investment. So yeah, keep your, keep your ex explanation short and keep your treatment efficient and you'll keep your overheads much lower. And it means you don't have to work so hard or so long or do so much dentistry in order to generate a, a better profit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that helps me think about the fact that the, the importance of bringing that larger view over the running of the practice that, if you were thinking about, um, and I might be off the mark here, but if you were thinking about employing a steri nurse to help with efficiency so your DA isn't taking that 10-minute room changeover every time you haven't got access to a second surgery, if you were thinking about hiring a hygienist and bringing in a hygiene department so that your surgery uh, as a practitioner dentist can become more efficient in there too, and you're thinking about doing the, going to these, in essence, additional costs to become more efficient, if you're running your practice as a as with 50 percent um uh covering all the the main run operational costs that still makes sense oh yeah yeah absolutely um i mean i used to have three nurses looking after me and that's still we're running with the 50 percent overhead i'd have um two chair sides and a float um so <laughs> one dentist two chair sides and a float and, and i that was so i could just diagnose and treat all day long. I didn't have to, you know, fill in lab sheets. I didn't have to pour up models. I didn't have to ring anybody. I just, I arrived at the office, I'd diagnose, treat. They'd tell me, go in room two, prep this, and I'd say, thank you, so, you know, away I'd go. So, um, yeah, yeah, the, it's just, um, the thing is, most practices, if one, the scary thing though, when you start to become more productive, all of a sudden you'll notice your book clearing out. That is, because as you become more productive, it seems when you're not so productive, it seems like you've got a really full book, and then you start to become more productive. And because you're doing things in short, less and less times, it seems like wow, we're having trouble filling the book now. <laughs> but that's that's another story. That's marketing the practice to get more new patients. But um, yeah, productivity will open up holes in your book that you can then fill with um, more productive type of patients. That's a nice position to be in. <laughs> to actually have some space in the appointment book to be able to reduce that level of stress down. I've got to get these people in the, in the book. So with that delegation yeah, side, yeah. I want to go into a whole bunch of hints that you may have in terms of how to become more efficient. But the delegation side, again, coming back to that recruitment space that, you know, it's challenging, more challenging nowadays than before to keep really good staff members. And one of the things that really does contribute to staff loyalty is that they're getting better and better. They feel like they're progressing in their role. And Tony Robbins is classic for saying that progress equals happiness. We are at our happiest as human beings when we feel like we're progressing. And you can be a DA in a dental practice where you're just, you know, sucking spit every day and changing rooms over and doing stereo, or you could be armed with the skills to be able to do all the lab sheet management and the additional tasks that can be delegated, model pouring, maybe additional communications with the patient to get them to get all their schedule done and their payment plan discussions and things. You can really add additional tasks to your team members that make them love their work because they feel like they're really truly co contributing. But in addition to that, they feel like they're progressing. I was speaking to a receptionist just last night who was tearfully telling me that she was thinking about leaving her place of employee, even though she loved it. She loved everything about it, but she just didn't feel like she was progressing. So adding these additional delegated tasks is, is another aspect of the benefits of becoming more efficient. Yeah, yeah. I have to tell a story against myself. And this was when we first went from four-handed uh, four dentistry to six-handed dentistry. And I was on a, a dental chat group, and I thought at this time I really had efficiency nailed, right? 
And uh, somebody posed the question, are you more efficient if you have six-handed dentistry or four-handed? And I replied, oh, no, you know, I don't think you'd be any more efficient. Anyway, um, and then I thought to myself, well, that's really stupid. I haven't tried it, but I've, I've sort of canned it already. So I went back to the staff and I said, we're going to try six-handed dentistry. And I said, can you work out what you want to do? Like, I didn't tell them this is how we're going to do it. I just said, can you work it out so that we can do six-handed? And so they worked out, okay, well, one of us sits in the traditional position and one of us will stand here and then one of I'll be the one who changes the birds and you'll be the one who passes the light and da da da, da and on. And, and so they worked the whole thing out and the stunning thing was our treatment times came down 30%. Imagine that, an extra 30%. So what was taking eight hours was now being done in what's 30% off eight, you know, like in, in five, you know, under six hours. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. stunning. And it was all, they just worked it all out and then I'm just watching going, this is, this is neat, guys, keep doing this, you know. <laughs> So the, yeah. they loved this this sense of autonomy and this sense of being able to control things and, and and work stuff out, and it was just it was absolutely fantastic. That is a terrific story, and I love what you said. You know, how could I criticise it without having tried it myself? I find that a lot working with uh, practitioners a lot with all with my work that to suggest something different to what they, they know, there's instant resistance to it because they have always done it this way or this way's always worked well and I can't see how anything else can work well. But I really do encourage people to try different things out, you know, access brilliant minds like yourself and do the thing and try it out and then make an assessment because that 30% drop in treatment time, obviously we're making more per hour. Or obviously, we're creating more space in our appointment book that could actually end up being more downtime for us as practitioners that, you know, we can have a bit more home time and uh, rest and relaxation time. Uh, and the amount of benefit of that 30% drop in treatment time is magnificent. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the concept that we used to work with in our office, were, I didn't know it had a name, but the Japanese call it Kaizen, which is the concept of continuous improvement. And um, the, the thing is, I mean, if you look around the dental industry, most dentists take, you know, 90 minutes, 75 minutes, whatever, something like that to prepare a crown and take the impression, fit the temporary, all that. That's, that's a rough standard time you see around the industry. But it's possible to do that in about 20 minutes, right? Um, maybe even a bit less if everything runs in your favour. So how do you go from 90 minutes to 20 minutes? Well, you can't do it in one big step. You can't suddenly flick a light switch and, and next day we're doing it in 20 minutes. But how you do it is by this process of incremental improvement where every time you do the procedure, you think, oh, now hold on. If, if the nurse changed the burrs instead of me changing the burrs, that would save some time, wouldn't it, you know? And, and then you go, yeah, you know, that, that, that shaved a minute and a half, you know? And then if the nurse knew the sequence of instruments, so I stuck to a sequence of instruments, so when I put my hand out, she knew exactly which instrument was the one that was required because so many dentists work in this random fashion where they sort of, oh, I think I'll use such and such. No, I might do this, you know, and they, they sort of, they're very hard to follow, but if, if the dentist became strict and um, used things in a certain sequence, then the nurses could get in this flow. Then you add the extra nurse. Then you add the float nurse who comes in and grabs things and takes things away. And, and then all of, it, you know, all of a sudden, one day, you know, a year and a half later, you're going, hey, our crown preps only take 20 minutes now. And you go, wow, <laughs> isn't that neat? You know, and I'm not saying they're, I mean, they're, they're still the same level of excellence in terms of clinical dentistry. They're still beautiful preps. But just through this process of Kaizen and continuous improvement, um, it, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. We used to be, one of the things that I always loved doing in my practice 
was running experiments, right? Guys, I wonder if we do X, Y, and Z, whether this will make us better. And then we'd try it, you know. And like one experiment, this is a really weird one. So many dentists think the big reason for their success in practice is their, their magnetic personality. You know, they've got this magnet and patients just love them and that's why they come. And so they do all this chit-chat, right? And the problem is lots of chit-chat equals high overhead, right? Because you're burning up productive time going like this, right? So chit-chat equals high ever overhead. That's my formula and I will stick to it. And I thought to myself, I wonder what would happen if I did no chit-chat at all. Let's run the experiment for a month and see what happens. So I had a month where I did zero chit-chat. The patient walked in, I'd say, hi, my name's Mark. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. Now, I understand you're here because you've got a broken tooth on the lower right. Is that correct? And we're straight into it. And as far as I could tell, the patient satisfaction was the same. Their, their enjoyment of the treatment. The only thing was we saved the minutes of chit-chat, which again then run, flows through to overhead, um, and the acceptance ratio was the same, the flow of new patients was the same. So I, I really encourage dentists this, this process of Kaizen and also the idea of constantly running experiments in your practice, saying, what if we did this? What if we did that? What if we did the other thing? Keeps it exciting and interesting for the dentist and exciting and interesting for the staff. You just agree we're going to try this this month and away you go. I love that. I absolutely love it. And it's interesting, just to call back to that, ex that experiment, that last experiment you just explained as well. <clears throat> I agree. I think sometimes we get fooled into thinking that patients love the social chit-chat, but at the end of the day, they're at a dentist. They're not at a social event. They've got busy lives as well. They've got to get bits and pieces done. And certainly, you know, if you went along to your lawyer who was charging per minute and they sit there and spend the first 10 minutes talking about family and holidays, you'd be like, I don't care about any of that. Let's get to the guts of it because you're charging me every minute. Time is money nowadays. Time is, you know, time I spend at the dentist is one, it's not the most enjoyable, enjoyable place to be. But also I've got a bunch of other things. I've got 20 other things to get done today as well. And so there is every chance that the patient satisfaction mm. actually increased because they like an efficient dental appointment time as well. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. I mean, I used to have an accountant uh, and we actually left him for this reason we'd see this accountant once a year. So it wasn't a social friend, wasn't, you know, anything. He was just our accountant. He used to do our books, right? And once a year we'd have a meeting and always he would do 45 minutes of chit-chat before we got to the accounting. And in the end, I just couldn't stand it. <laughs> I actually just changed accountants because I didn't want to sit through the chit-chat. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. But that constant and never-ending improvement stuff is just brilliant and it really does help bring down that, you know, it's not about going from 1 to 10 in just a few days. It is about identifying each of those steps, getting the team on board with it, proficient with it, experimenting, seeing what works for you and breaking out of that, that framework that we normally have. This is what needs to happen in order for us to do our dentistry. That, well, let's think, let's step out of that, um, and go into a more creative space. And I, it's bringing me back to that thought around Autal Green again. One of the reasons why she does the work that she does is from studies that were conducted that indicated that when little children, you know, babies, toddlers, they're very innovative and creative in the way that they, have. obviously in the first seven years you're learning so much, of course their brains are so innovative and creative. And then as we grow older, um, and the, sorry, the, the, the experiments that were being done were indicating that little babies and little toddlers were actually at genius level of thinking and problem solving. And then as we grow up and we're brought up by parents and go into kinder and school and all the things, we slowly get de-geniused. And then by the time these kids, when they're being tracked every five years, by the time they're adults, only 5% of them or 3% of them have that genius code still within them. It's all kind of been knocked out of them over time. And to recognise that and that it's a different way of thinking. And I think the experiments really help with that because it's not 
coming from a perspective of the next idea I have has to be the success, it has to be successful, it has to work. No, we're just going to give it a try. We're going to you know, acknowledge all of the ideas that we've got and we're going to give everything a try and just see what works. I love it. I absolutely love it. So to organise you know, people in a way of so they can actually really start to see specifically what can I try out in my practice, in my surgery, because it doesn't have to be just in the practice itself. You can be an employee dentist and just give it a try with your DA in your surgery and see what kind of traction you can get. Uh, again, through researching your work around this and, you know, having other thoughts kind of pop in, in my mind, the top thing you can do is first of all look at the systems isn't it look at your current systems of how you're practicing clinically how much time you spend you're, you're taking for chit chat that how much that adds in time room changeovers things like that but one of the other things I noticed when I was researching you was really make sure that your equipment's working for you and I agree I, I've worked with practices that sharpen all their scalers make sure that their probes are nice and pointy their that their um, EMS scalers are nice and new and the opposition to that where everything's blunt and everything's taking a lot longer. <laughs> so the equipment's important. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, actually, I have to tell you about another experiment I tried that, that worked out really well, and this is a very equipment-related one, was I was thinking to myself, how many burrs do I need to prepare a crown? How many burrs? And if you go into a lot of practices, you know, they say, oh, we're going to do a crown. Let's have the crown burr kit. And they bring out this thing that's got like 14 burrs on it, right? And 14 burrs is like you've got to change, you're constantly changing burrs and hunting, oh, where, where's the round, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And I thought to myself, to do a posterior crown, how many burrs do I really need? And I actually got it down to one. <laughs> wow. And maybe for every particular, uh, like, Prepping a tooth, it's, it's all about angles and um, corners and edges and all that sort of stuff. So as long as you get a burr that will allow you to produce those things, I mean, it may not be the exact right burr for occlusal reduction, but it's it's good enough, you know, like it's 90% good enough. And, and yeah, just, just amazing. And, and if I'd never asked the question, how many burrs do I need to produce a crown? I'd still be having one of these giant kits that I brought out all the time. Um, the yeah. staff really helped with that. I mean, they um, they were always asking the questions, can we get like double-ended instruments? You know, the, these instruments where you've got a, a sickle probe on one end and a perio probe on the other. Every time you cut an instrument off your setup, that's less instruments you've got to sort through, less instruments they have to sterilise, um, less, less, you know, like after you've finished a, a procedure the the tray is pretty messy and so when you if you're having to hunt for an instrument that slows you down all these sorts of things i mean if you think about um, also on equipment one thing that amazes me is so many people have that system where they have the the cart with the hanging cord you know and and the and that's of course at the dentist's right hand side and when you're a young dentist, it doesn't really matter the fact that you've got to turn your head, reach over here and grab the cart, you know. But as you get older, as you get in your 40s or 50s or whatever, the fact that you've had to turn your head 97,000 times to find the handpiece becomes an issue. You know, the trapezius muscle up here starts to get a bit tired of that. You know, but whereas so much better is that that whip arm system where where the all the you know the hand pieces are right in front of you. They're just in your peripheral view. You could grab them yourself, but as we reached the stage of having six handed dentistry, all I did was put my hand out, and the nurse would actually put the hand piece into my hand. So, and then when you want to get rid of it, you just release it like this without even breaking your your vision of uh, of what you're working on. Um, yeah, there's so much can be done with equipment in terms of making dentists more efficient. And dentists just don't... Um, one of the saddest things, I think, is I've got a friend who's about 10 years older than me, and he reached a level in about the 1980s where he was happy with his practice. And in 2024, he's still practising the same way he was in the 1980s. And I think that is super sad. Like he's had 30 years where he hasn't moved on and, and things have changed so much. It's, it's yeah, 
dentistry can be super exciting if you open your mind to change and you start really looking at possibilities. Yeah, and that lends itself beautifully into the, you know, looking at technology and how that can make you more efficient too. You know, we've had things like CEREC machines that reduce the need for additional appointment times for the, for patients, scanners so we don't have to worry about all the impressions and ferrying the impressions with a courier back and forth to labs, all the things, and having to retake impressions because they're not perfect the first time round, and then, God forbid, having to bring the patient back for another impression because the lab didn't like it. But AI... I imagine too, the introduction of AI into dentistry to not assist with the diagnosis, but to assist with patient treatment plan acceptance rates because there's nothing like seeing is believing. And when a a younger dentist that's still getting into the groove of effective communication and patient engagement in their treatment, uh, to be able to say uh, the AI has identified all of these areas, again, that can shave off time in terms of the amount of communication required to have with a patient with in terms of getting them on board with the treatment that they need. Pearl AI is the one that is strongest in my mind. They've got, I've got a, they've, I think they're the largest in dentistry worldwide, or they have been up, up until recently. But this is where your x-rays are passed into the AI portal and it identifies uh, areas of decay and bone loss and um, different aspects within the x-rays itself. So it adds an additional layer of information that dentists can use in terms of their diagnosis. But it does have that wonderful mm. benefit of, it's just like it's like having when the intraoral cameras came about, there was nothing like showing the patient on a large screen, see that huge crack or that large whatever. And it's right there in front of the seeing is believing they can see the evidence for themselves and AI can have that additional benefit to it. But I've also heard, I don't know if this is all set in stone and available now, I'm sure it must be, but where the, and you can get AI installed on your computer. So as the dentist is speaking their diagnosis and charting, the AI is picking up on that. And then at the end of the appointment time, it can generate the treatment plan (laughs) or the written, the written treatment plan that gets passed on to the patient. It can create that without the need of other hands actually taking time to actually do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I guess my nurse was my AI. She was standing there typing things as I said them. So, yeah. But, um. <laughs> I think the rest of technology now can be enormous. And from the perspective of um, my, my personal use of ChatGPT, I tell you what, just to take away the additional contemplation and thought sometimes of getting my mind and all my ideas right and then putting them into a format where it's a professional and friendly email that goes out to potential clients, etc., and existing clients, I think I, I currently think I'm about five times more productive every day just because I'm not taking as long as I would normally take in drafting content, drafting stuff. And so I think there's a role for mm-hmm. AI in um, the efficiency space as well. <laughs> Certainly, how about scheduling and having a, well, having a well-structured appointment book? What, does, you know, what are your thoughts around efficiency and having that link at reception of how the appointment book is actually structured? Uh, I'd say a couple of things about scheduling. One is it's super important that when you finish the examination appointment and the consultation with the patient, you've got a definitive treatment plan where you've got visit one, visit two, visit three, visit four, all laid out. Um, I see a lot of practices, they don't treatment plan properly. They just sort of chart what's on the chart and then they go, next visit, continue treatment. That's their treatment plan, you know, and so they just book half an hour and and the dentist is meant to find half an hour of stuff to do the next time the patient wanders in the door. And I found what made us, like the, the people there, I just say, next time we're doing the lower right. And everybody knew what was the lower right. They knew how long it took, all this sort of stuff. So it was so really having a definitive treatment plan, I think, is is super important for scheduling productively. Um, I don't really have any other thoughts on scheduling. I mean, there was so much of that was taken care of by by the team around me. So uh, I didn't have to didn't have to worry about that, really. Yeah. 
I agree with you. I've certainly worked in the past with practices where the dentist did step out all that whole treatment plan. This is visit one, visit two, as you said. And as a, this was back when I was a um, patient facilitator. And what I usually found was that when you get the chance to be able to book in all of the appointment times that a patient needs to get their treatment done, the commitment by the patient to each of those appointment times is higher because this is all a big set plan. Mm. And if I remove one of those appointment times or move it around, it's going to muck up the whole plan. And so I often found that it, it, that once I'd had all those, you know, six or eight appointment times in the system for a patient, I felt more relaxed as a patient facilitator because I thought um, that's a committed plan now. Everyone's on board and that's going to stay, that's in stone now. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 I agree. How did you, what's the, what's the role of team training with this? When you were employing additional team members onto your team and you had all these wonderful systems in play, did that level of, of efficiency, the kind of systems that you had, did you find it quite straightforward to get new team members on board and up and skilled up to that level? Well, they pick it up from the people around them. Um, and so that's really, it's interesting that they'd come in and they'd see, they'd observe the way the place runs. And as long as you're not changing too many team members, I mean, if you're changing half your team every six months, it'd be a huge problem. But as long as you've got a reasonable working conditions and you're keeping long-term staff, then if you lose one person, well, the new person just comes in and they say, oh, wow, that's how we do things around here. And they just fit in with the system. So we always found team training relatively easy. Um, a couple of things. The first thing was they had to understand intellectually what was going on. So we had a manual and we'd have, okay, you're going to learn how to do surgery setup. So here's the, here's the pages in the manual you need to read, read them overnight or read them tomorrow, you know, and, and we'll, we'll start training you on that. So that, that actually, that was step one to understand it intellectually. Step two was they'd do whatever they had to do under supervision or, or sorry, they'd watch someone do it. Um, so they'd watch an experienced staff member do what they needed to do. Then step three was they did it under supervision of an experienced staff member. And then step four was they were qualified. So there was that understand, watch, do, and then they were qualified. That was the, the sequence that they went through with staff training. And that takes that arduous element out of team training, doesn't it? that, you know, quite often the practitioner can think, oh, now we've got to go through this huge training process, but that's a delegated task too. And that's right, as you say, you learn and become a master at doing those things through the doing itself and you've got this other team member to be able to support in that as well. Again, like that additional element and the benefit of having an effectively staffed practice is, is so good. How about you spoke a little bit about I've got here the physical structure of the practice. So you spoke a little bit about the hand pieces and the, the cables that droop down as opposed to the ones that are more close to hand. How did you find, would, I, mean, I imagine that there is an efficient way of having a dental practice set up and then there's a less efficient way of having a dental practice set up. Yeah, yeah. Well, in my last practice, we had tiny surgeries and we were ultra efficient because in a tiny surgery, everybody can reach everything, like everything's within reach. Um, and also, it means that, like so many dentists use their surgery as a storage area. Like they just have stuff stored away. And then you say, let's get out the such and such. And then people are opening drawers and things like this. Whereas much more efficient if you're working on a modular system where whatever procedure you need, you've got a box. So, for instance, with us, when we wanted somebody to come in with a sore tooth and we'd realise that we're going to have to start a root filling. So for us, starting a root filling, getting set up for it was root filling box, root filling box open, we're ready. <laughs> like that was the setup time. Or if they'd come in and they needed a crown, oh, we're going to do a crown. Okay, crown box, open, we're ready. That, that like literally how long it took to describe it is how long it took to do it. And one of the worst experiences I ever had when I was working in other practices, I, I visited this or was working in this practice and we had somebody come in and they needed a root canal. So I said, we need to do a root canal. So the nurse immediately vanished, right? She's gone. She's left the room. So 
I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting and a couple of minutes, two minutes, three minutes go by, four minutes, and I, I'm like, what could be happening? So I headed out the, and I went off in search of the nurse. I head down the hallway and I get to the stairy area and there she is and she's opening drawers and she'd open a drawer, she's got a tray in front of her and she'd reach in and she'd grab something and put it on the tray and close that drawer. And then she'd go over, open another drawer, reach in, grab something, put it on the tray, right? And this was how they set up for a root filling. So every time you're going to do a root filling, it was going to be your nurse was going to vanish for seven or eight minutes as she goes around and, and assembles the kit one thing at a time. And I just thought, gee, life is so hard as opposed to this, here's the kit, open, we're ready. You know, <laughs> But dentists, again, whoever set that practice up, whoever run, it, it never occurred to them that we can, you know, there is such a thing as kits, you know. Yeah, yeah. You bring back so many memories for me. <laughs> I spent so many wasted hours opening and closing drawers. Yeah, and I, I even hate the trolleys. Yeah. I even hate the trolleys, like those trolleys that you wheel into the room. Like what what a waste of space. What a waste of, you know, like and it, the trolley's got everything in it. Like but just put a kit together. It's so easy, you know. You go to Bunnings and you buy a plastic box and it's got all these segments in it and you label every segment and, you know, this is the one where you put this, this, you know, everything's labelled and, and then you put a picture of it in the stereo area fully set up so that when the staff is restocking it, um, they, they just look at the picture and they put everything in the right place. And then you have another rule that they're not allowed to put it back in the surgery until it's fully restocked. Because otherwise, next time you go to use it, you open it and something's missing. <laughs> so, you know, but I mean, these are all just simple systems. But once you get them nailed, that's, that's where you, your productivity takes off exponentially. That's it. And just, gosh... All of those steps, like I've opened the, the kit up and something's not there or she's left the room and I don't know, know where she's gone and she's, you know, going through all the drawers. That's just all layered frustration, layered frustration. So at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, the practitioners like, and all the team are like, I'm so exhausted, where we can remove all of that kind of level of frustration just by proper planning. Now, one of the things I did note down was the importance of morning huddles in terms of efficiency, but now I'm, there's other benefits to the morning huddle, but from an efficiency perspective, morning huddles may not be needed because the systems are supporting that easy workflow of the day. Yeah, I, I mean, I bought into that traditional idea of having morning huddles for years, you know, just it was part of the the, the rules of dentistry that you had to have a morning huddle. And, and, you know, it was, they were okay. But once we reached that level of training where everybody knew exactly what they were meant to do, morning huddles are redundant. It's, it's you, you may as well just enjoy a coffee and then start work. Like it, you don't need to have them. They don't. They don't serve a purpose when everybody is sufficiently trained. Now, if everybody is a bit clueless, you know, and, and I, I hate to say it, I've been in practices where everyone is a bit clueless. Well, the morning huddle helps to orient them. You need to do this, and you need to do this, and don't forget to ring the laboratory, and you know. But I mean, if 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 they know that their job is to ring the laboratory and make sure the job's back before the appointment, what's the point of me telling them that? They know that already. It just, just annoys them, the fact that I'm telling them something that they already know how to do. So we actually eliminated morning huddles for the last years I was in practice and, and it, it really yeah, it made no difference at all. Again, another good experiment to, to have because I've always been a huge supporter of morning huddles, but this whole conversation has, has shifted my mind around all of that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, could I, could, I, could I just come back with that morning huddle? I mean, it presupposes that you've got your staff well enough trained that you never have to say anything. Like they know, you know, but, but me telling the front desk what they need to do, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, if they're well enough trained, they should be. They tell they tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And we got to remember every time we tell, remind somebody what to do, 
we are thinking for them and giving them the subconscious belief that they don't have to think for themselves. And so wherever we can extend that autonomy out, stop checking up on people, just give them the task, let them go through that process of practicing until they recognize how important it is and, and developing mastery in that thing. Because it's just like a child. If you are always saying to the child, now, now's the time to feed the dog, now's the time to wash up before dinner, now's the time to do your homework, they don't, that subconscious thing for them, they don't think for themselves anymore. So we've really got to make sure that we continue down that path as well. So you do a lot of work with dental practices one-on-one. -on -one. Can you tell us a little bit about how if practices out there are thinking, oh, yeah, we've got to become more efficient. There are so many benefits here and so many things that we don't know about it. Uh, how can you work with them? Uh, well, I, I do practice visits. So in the last little while, I've flown to, you know, all different parts of Australia. And I, I really enjoy just talking with practices. And um, it, it's interesting, even though I've sort of thought about efficiency and the, these these issues for years, every practice I visit, I learn something new. But then equally, I've never seen a practice, even some beautifully run ones that where I can't give them some great ideas for helping improve their efficiency. So it's 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 a really um, interesting process. I just spoke with a practice yesterday, and we had a we had a great day, and we we totally reworked their new patient experience because they were giving a very variable ex new patient experience. Like they had multiple practitioners there, and depending on who they saw, they might get a new patient experience that's up here, and someone else they might get a new patient experience that's down here. And we we reworked their new patient experience to make it sort of more of a wow thing for the new patients coming in the door because that's a, a really interesting thing. I mean, if you can get a new patient in the door and they go, oh, my goodness, I have never been treated this well. I've never had such a wonderful experience at a dentist. Like your, your acceptance rates go through the roof and your retention of patients. I mean, everybody out there is screaming for new patients. We need more patients. We need more patients. But you get someone in the door and then you give them a mediocre experience, they're not bonded to your practice. They'll Next month, they'll try this practice down the You get them in the door and give them an absolute wow experience. So that was what I did yesterday with a practice and we had a, a great time doing it. But um, yeah, that's how I work with practice. I just like that that one-on-one -on -one sort of interaction with a practice or with a team. I find that really challenging and interesting and I think people get great results out of it. Yeah, you learn something from everything and you've got such tremendous insights, not just about efficiency, but other aspects of dental practice operations as well. I really do encourage people to reach out. And, you know, as you, you know, just a reminder to what you said before, don't judge things until you give it a good shot. There is a way of, to come back to the focus of this particular episode, there is a way of becoming far more efficient as a dental practice and there's a whole list of benefits that come from that. If practices do want to reach out, what's their best next step? Uh, the relaxeddentist.com. The relaxeddentist.com. So just, um, yeah, get on there, jump on the contact page, send me a message. I'll get back to you with, normally within a day. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the way to reach out. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Mark. This has really opened my eyes up to this. You know, I've been working with practices for so many years, it's crazy, but it's just really opened my eyes up to the possibilities of this side. This is just, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting topic. I can see why this is a popular part of what you do, the work that you do. Thanks so much for sharing all your experiences and insights today. I really appreciate it. Good. Thank you, Julie. If you enjoyed this podcast, then I encourage you to head over to Amina and my website, dentalbusinessmastery.com.au. You will find all the information that you need if you would like to gain our assistance in helping you and your team achieve great success. Thanks so much for listening.